they live life thinking, oh, I could always do better. I can get more. I can make something better. I can make it a more improvement in the world. And so they figure out a way, how do I make that happen? So they're dissatisfied. No matter what they do, they leave a little dissatisfied knowing they can do more. But that's a slippery slope because you can do that and be miserable your entire life, feeling like you've never done enough, feeling like you're never good enough, that you're always falling short. So I think it's essential that you have to find a way to be happy and dissatisfied at the same time. Welcome to the show. Thank you so much for listening. And we've got a great show for you today. We've got my business partner, Jeff Gunnis, on the show today. He's building a giant company on the East Coast, and he's going to talk about building businesses from vision. Uh, he's going to talk about why would you choose? When you have a choice that you face, can you get them both? Your career, your family, all the good things. Why choose? How do you accomplish everything you want to set out to accomplish? And interesting, you're going to get some insight into what it takes to make a partnership work. As you listen to me and Jeff interact, as we talk about our other partners, kind of an interesting episode for me because I haven't done this with Jeff before. Welcome to the show. Thank you for listening. Welcome to the Edge of Excellence. Well, Jeff Gunnis, not on a boat, Best not in an office, not in a meeting making time for your business partner of 31 years. Welcome to the show. Welcome to the Edge of Excellence. Thank you for making time. What's up, man? How you doing? Good to be here with you. Oh, it's taken a while, Jeffrey. It's taken a while, but I'm glad you made it. We want to hear about it. We're going to get into becoming an entrepreneur right out of college. We're going to get into building national brands, a few of them. We're going to get into setting vision and building culture. And man, I'm proud of the culture and the vision you guys have over there at Home Genius. But before we do, I got to ask you the same question I ask everybody. Jeff Gunnis, what is your definition of excellence? Ooh, that's a good question. You know, I, just, I love your energy, Matt. You know, it's just like, it's kind of, I think I need to go grab a cup of coffee real quick to, to get right up right there with you. The only so, time my energy it. goes down is when I'm in a meeting with you, Spence, and Jeff. <laughs> The rest of the time, I've liked this all the time. <laughs> this is your normal, your normal self. My I love normal it. Self. I love it. Well, I, you know, I spent some time thinking about this uh, because I think it's good to have a. It's good to define words and know what you're talking. You know what you're, that they mean to you. Um, so I went to the internet to look around and poke around. Didn't didn't find too much too much there to help me out. I did find a good quote by Aristotle. You've probably heard before since you run the Edge of Excellence podcast. You are the sum of your five closest friends. What's that? You are no, sub- not that one. Okay. Not that one. Not that one. But uh, Aristotle says excellence is never an accident. It's a choice, not chance, that determines your destiny. So I kind of locked on to that idea of a choice. So my definite, uh, definition of excellence is this. It's a choice to pursue the best version of yourself, to strive for the highest level of your capacity in all of your endeavors, but to do so in a way that you can both be happy and dissatisfied at the same time. Okay, choice to produce the first part, choice to pursue the best version of yourself. Okay, so to be excellent, you have to choose to be excellent and make choices every single day that lead to that. What was the second part? Well, that's the thing. Yeah, going back on that, because choice is the key part of that. All these words are very intentional because excellence doesn't fall into it. Excellence is definitely not the same thing as talent. You have to make a choice to strive for something, and it's for the pursuit of it. It's also the best version of yourself. It's not the best version, the best thing that's out there. It's not to become the best of a particular area. It's the best version of you. And that's an important distinction because some people can get caught up in the idea of to be excellent, I think be the absolute best in my field. No, you have to be the best version of what you can do. And if so you don't that believe out, that you can, be, you, you can be excellent at one thing. So an excellent athlete that's playing in the NBA and dunking all the time, but in the news for you know, whatever bad behavior and isn't the help in the community is a basketball player, but not excellent because excellent involves more than just the task you do. Absolutely. That's the second part of the definition is you have to strive because the word strive is intentional because it's pursuing excellence is hard. It's a task. It's a grind. It's a work ethic that has to come along with it to make it, to make it happen. 
And it's to strive for the highest level of your capacity in all of your endeavors. So it's, again, your capacity, not the capacity of others, not to have that green-eyed monster come out to be envious of what other people are achieving. What are you able to achieve? And it's in all of your endeavors. You have to balance all aspects of your life to pursue those things. So just to your perfect, perfect example that you just had there, you can be that fantastic athlete, but if you're a terrible father, if you're a terrible husband, you're not pursuing excellence. You have a very narrow scope of where you're doing it. So it has to be in all of your endeavors. That's the idea that how you do anything is how you do everything. Do you, do you think that some people can never be excellent because the best version of themselves isn't good enough? Well, I think that's the last part of this. And that's why that's the part that I, I, I lean into the hardest is that the way you have to be able to do so in a way you can be, be both happy and be dissatisfied at the same time. Because in dissatisfied, most, most high achievers tend to be dissatisfied. That's why they're, they're working so hard to achieve because they live life thinking, oh, I can always do better. I can get more. I can make something better. I can make it a more improvement in the world. And so they figure out a way, how do I make that happen? So they're dissatisfied. No matter what they do, they leave a little dissatisfied knowing they can do more. But that's a slippery slope because you can do that and be miserable your entire life, feeling like you've never done enough, feeling like you're never good enough, that you're always falling short. So I think it's essential that you have to find a way to be happy and dissatisfied at the same time. You have to enjoy the process. You have to celebrate the wins. You have to notice the growth, the 1% better every day. You can't just beat yourself up consistently and stress yourself out on the path. You have to enjoy the process. Absolutely. But also on the flip side, if you're just happy, go lucky all the time and you just, you know, live that that sign that's in most places where you go to a beach shack and it says the way to happiness is to lower your expectations. If you do that <laughs> and you're just happy, okay, you're not dissatisfied. You're right in the wrong you'll never beach strive. shack, dude. I don't know what you're I've never, I've never even heard of that sign. Is, that, is it right next to the it's wine 30 sign? I think so. Oh I think so. God. It's five o'clock someplace. Read a better beach shack. All right. Well, <laughs> that was that was definitely interesting. So I'm just going to recap it. Pursuing the best version of yourself striving for the highest level of your complete capacity in a way that you're happy and dissatisfied at the same time. That's a great definition. And we're going to come back to that definition, but we got to, we got to get into being in the top 50 of qualified remodelers, building a hundred million dollar or $200 million business, becoming a USA today, best-selling author. I think more than once. Um, and before I get into these giant accomplishments of building these brands, and we didn't even mention the customer service, which I've mentioned on the show before. We didn't even mention the company culture, which I mentioned on the show before. Before we get into how to do all that, we got to go back to Norco, California, and high school, and UC Santa Barbara. Probably, I think that UC Santa Barbara is the best school on the West Coast. Uh, I think it's number one. Sure. Ranked. I thought it was the Harvard of the West, isn't it? As my brother said, if you if you call yourself the something of the West, you're not that. So Harvard is the Santa Barbara <laughs> of the East. Um, but before go. we but before we get into all these accomplishments and how great you're doing and building culture and all these tips, what was life like for you in high school? Throw in the pig skin out there in Norco. How'd you see yourself? How'd you find your path? Well, you know, you're hurting my heart just a little bit, Matt, because Norco was our crosstown rival. So I went to Corona High School and Norco was, uh, oh, they were, they're, they're the worst. They're, they're terrible human beings. So, so it's Corona, in Corona we were fantastic. It was Corona. <laughs> <laughs> okay. So throwing the pigskin, being quarterback, being the quarterback at Cambridge University, all this stuff you did. But before you went to college, you were in Corona, California. And I think you were in Saudi Arabia for a little bit of high school. And maybe you were even somewhere else. How'd you see yourself? How'd you fit in? You know, was life just roses and you're just on the track to being this um, billion dollar CEO or were you suffering and nerdy and kind of not there yet? You know, I had a pretty good time in high school. People talk about, you know, middle school and high school being like these really terrible, awful years sometimes about uh, how challenging it is. And um, it was I had, a, I had a pretty good time. Um, as you mentioned, I, I grew up overseas in Greece, Cyprus and Saudi Arabia from the age from five to 12. So I had that experience of always being the new kid, having to make new friends quickly. You just had no choice because when you move around that often, you have to learn how to do that. So moved to California right after junior high. So only for the high, my high school years, 
again, new kid coming in there, had to create a new circle of friends. And I just, just, you know, found my own tribe. I think no matter where you go, you've got to find your tribe of people that are, are share your values are the people you like to be around people that will lift you up. And I was lucky enough to find that, um, in, in Corona, uh, both in, in sports, but also in the classroom. I, I'm actually one of those guys that enjoyed, enjoyed, uh, writing and, and even back in high school, uh, would write look kind of long form stories and that sort of thing. So. Um, I had a really good time in high school, and I, I know you did too. So uh, we, we've compared notes before. Uh, high school wasn't too shabby. I do think that high school, even though I had a good time and I was doing well, I do think it was one of the worst four years of my life. At the time, I thought it was the best. And in college, I thought it was the second best, just because you don't know who you are. And there's so much comparing yourself to others, and everybody's doing better than you. And I think now it's worse with Instagram. And I just feel so bad for the generation now that can't even get away from it. So while I had a great time in high school and I and you had a great time in high school, I think every phase since then has been a little bit better. But you were doing well in school. Um, you were good at socializing. And there's studies that show that you move your kids around like that. They're better at socializing, which has applied to business. You're better at listening. You're better at building relationships fast. But you were doing pretty well in school. You were doing all the extracurricular activities. You were on the path to what did you want to do for a living? You know, at the time, I thought I wanted to go into business. Um, uh, I, I'd always been, you know, selling things. My dad was an entrepreneur, a serial entrepreneur. Um, you know, that's what the reason why he moved around the world. He had started an import expert business. So I'd, I'd just seen that lifestyle, and that's something that I wanted to do. Um, but I also thought at the time I wanted to be a writer. I wanted to be, I, I loved writing, I loved uh, reading books. and. So I thought uh, I, I might do that. Then I realized I found out that most writers uh, live in their 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 parents' basements because they're not making any money. And so I decided I, when I went to, when I went to college, I decided I would jump into a business career and and, and check that out. I also considered politics at the time too. I uh, looked around and thought that it would be a great opportunity to impact other people's lives by getting into politics. And so when I went to when I went to school, I did a double major in business economics and political science. And uh, quickly found out politics was not for me, not not my bag at all. So, uh, so I ended up with a business degree. Political science, you did not get a business degree. They don't have business at UC Santa Barbara. Business, econ business economics. Okay. Yeah, economics so you degree. had poli sci, yeah. business economics is how you started. Yep. Okay, there's some wisdom there. I just want to pause real quick. If you're on the road listening at 1.5 speed, time to pull over. Don't write while you're driving. Um, Jeff had a goal. He wanted to be a writer. He had a passion. He wanted to um, write books and he was doing it in high school. He was doing it in college. And then he checked the practicality of his passion. So you might be listening right now and you wanna be the star quarterback of the Chargers. Maybe that's not very practical or you're living in Aliso Viejo and your parents are pressuring you to do nothing but baseball, never have a job because you're gonna go get a scholarship from college and maybe you'll be a pro. So Jeff checked the practicality of his passion and I wanted to be a teacher. And I checked the practicality of my passion and I realized that it's not gonna accomplish all my goals. So Jake is like, I'm sorry, Jake. Jake's my wonderful son. Jeff is like Deion Sanders. And no one here knew who Deion Sanders was until he moved to Colorado and started coaching. But prior to that, he was a two sport professional athlete and he used to do these ads. And the ads were always an either or choice. You get this or that. And then he would always say, do you remember what Deion Sanders would say in the commercial? So what do you both. Say? Both. Both. I want yep. both. So Jeff figured out, and you listening right now can figure out how to have your cake and eat it too. I have a passion for mountain biking. I'm not going to be a professional mountain biker. I have a passion for for teaching, and I found a business with Jeff where I get to be a teacher, but it meets some of my other needs. Jeff is a writer. He is a writer. He's USA Today best-selling author. I know one of his books sold more, more books than Dean Koontz's book sold at the same release. Um, he's good at writing. Very scary shit. Very disturbing. Uh, but <laughs> very good at it. And he's a business person. So if you're listening right now, can you have your cake and eat it too? Can you do both? Maybe you won't be a professional quarterback, but you could be a coach and something else. Maybe you won't be a movie star, 
um, and you've realized this isn't my thing. I'm not that great at acting, but you can work in the local theater and do something else. So quick in life, early in life, I guess you could say, since you practice proper English, um, early in life, you decided, wait a second, I need to follow a passion that will do more than one thing. And you kind of split off and you chase business, but you kept that writing thing in the background. And that became, a, a, I, I, I've been with you sometimes when that's a four hour a day job. And I know you can't really write more than four hours because your brain turns off. I learned that from Jeff, but you were working four hours a day, seven days a week writing and 12, 10 hours a day, six days a week doing business. And you have, I think, 11 kids and a wonderful wife. I know you go to all the events. Um, you have really tight relationships. The kids come home. So back to your definition of excellence, you're pursuing the best version of yourself as a business person. You're pursuing the best version of yourself as a writer. You're pursuing the best version of yourself as a wonderful, loving husband and mentor to me and our other business partners on how to be a husband. Um, I wish that Nicole would mentor our wives on how to be better wives. It's way easier for you. Did I just say that? I'm not editing that out. Striving for the highest level in every single area um, and happy because you're vetting your choices, right? You're vetting, I love writing. I love business. I love the process. I love the levers. So hopefully you're still parked on the side of the road because we're going to keep going with this. But that's, I mean, I think you're lucky because I've met a lot of people through this. Well, I've done a lot of podcasts and I know a lot of people. Most people don't have that realization in high school. If you haven't had it yet, don't worry. Most people don't have it in college. If you haven't had it yet, don't worry. Most people start having that realization in their 20s after they've tried a few things and they decide, I'm going to go down this path. And maybe the path changes and they go down another path. So it's a process. You have to enjoy the process of figuring out your unique abilities, your passions, vetting them for practicality, um, readjusting. You want to be an Instagram celebrity? You need a million followers. So maybe you do something else and you do something more practical. So we'll fast forward to paradise. So you're in Corona. Um, Before you go on, let me just want to take on that because I think what you said is really, is really insightful. What we talk about with my, with my kids is it casts this whole idea with the idea of why choose. And when we talked earlier about how you do anything is how you do everything, having that idea of the why choose mentality permeates everything that you do. So even on even social with our family, if we're going to decide, hey, should we want to go do this, you know, go to the Cherry Blossom Festival down in Washington, D.C., or do we want to do the, this campfire with a bunch of friends? One of my kids will say, well, dad, why choose? That's what you're always saying. Why choose? Let's do both. Let's figure out how to make both work in what we're doing. And that's an important part of this. But everything you just mentioned, though, um, I'm very happy with all the things that you mentioned that we're, we're I'm able to do, but also very dissatisfied with all of this. I could be a far better father, a far better husband. Um, I can be a far better writer, far better, far better a business. I'm happy with all those things, but that dissatisfaction never leaves. And that, that dissatisfaction also doesn't take away any of the happiness I feel from the things that I have been able to do in those areas. So having that why choose mentality can make a huge difference if you adopt an early age. And uh, by the way, in preparation for this call, I've had a conversation with your children and with Nicole, who all say they're satisfied with how well they've done it being kids and being married to you. But keep up the good work, they said, Dad. Keep up the good work. So you leave Corona and you go to absolute paradise. Um, and had you been to Santa Barbara like frequently before you chose to go to Santa Barbara? No, I did. A, I did a tour up north. I went to Berkeley, went to Stanford and checked everything out. It was cold and gray and rainy and everybody was ugly. It was terrible. And then I came down to UC Santa Barbara and the clouds parted and the sun was out and everybody was sunbathing. And like, the, the angels came down and started singing songs. And it was wonderful. So was it a one day tour of Santa one Barbara? Visit. One day tour of Santa Barbara. I was all in 100 percent. So this is so funny. I mean, I don't know how many hours you and I have spent talking, but it's got to be 10,000. I mean, it's an unbelievable amount of time we spent talking over 32 years. And sometimes it's all day long we're talking, right? It's some, usually it's about work. I didn't realize that your path was the same as mine. I had all these different schools I was looking at. I swung by Santa Barbara for one day, and I hate to admit this, it was the sunbathers. And I said, I got to go to school here. 
I'm from New Mexico. You're from inland California. You're right on the water. You got the palm trees. The grass is beautiful. The people are beautiful. And there's all these people sunbathing. And I'm like, I'm going to lose 45 pounds. I'm going to come in. Maybe I had image issues then that I don't now. And so you go to Santa Barbara. And as I recall, you and I had a lot of jobs. I worked at that horrible restaurant. Shout out to the worst restaurant in Santa Barbara. What's the one on the pier? I blocked the name out of my mind. Um, whatever it is, it's the one on the pier. Don't eat there. I worked there. I worked for Michael Huffington. I, I can't even remember all the jobs I had. And you had a bunch of different jobs too, right? Well, I had jobs in high school, but when I came there, I, I did work for Michael Huffington. Uh, you did well. too? Um, and then I didn't- I didn't too, even yeah. know you worked so, for Michael Huffington. Look at this. Look at this. We can finally have a podcast. We get, get to know each other, Matt. Did you know I worked for <laughs> Michael Huffington? I didn't know about that. I was like, per it perked my ear. Up. Did you work for the, in the general or in the uh, the primary? I worked for his congressional election in the real election when he lived in Santa Barbara with Ariana. And I went over to the house and Ariana gave me her big old thick book. And then she dumped him and started the Huffington Post. The uh, the Picasso book, right? I had to schluff those around to her, uh, her book signings. I worked for them for the primary, decided I didn't like him. So after he won the primary against Robert Lager Marcino, I said, I'm out. So, uh, I was I was I was done with uh, Republican politics at that point. Learn something new every day. So we we basically have a very similar path. So we work for Michael Huffington. I was going to go. We're do the, the same UC. person. Yeah, we, we might be. We look the same. Oh my <laughs> god, you're like a fat version of me. I went to the the UC, <laughs> UC program and I did College Works instead. So did you just start off with College Works in college? I did. Yeah. So my I worked for uh, Huffington over the winter, and I actually had, I, I had actually interviewed for College Works and I had sold them no um, in November. And I went and go work for Michael Huffington instead. Decided he was uh, an idiot. So I, I left left the Huffington campaign, went and I called College Works painting. And it was, I, I didn't know at the time, but it was four days before the final training for the year. So they sent uh, Annie Annable, a person you and I both know, to come up to Santa Barbara to do a final interview with me. And I was hired on a Thursday and drove down to L.A. on a Friday. And I was in training for the fact that we did three day training. So I was there for a three day training uh, the day after I was hired. And you were a freshman? I was a freshman. Yeah. And that's when we didn't hire freshmen. Yeah, that was a, that was a, it was a heavy bar. When I was in high school, I had I worked on a door to door job where I was running an office where I, I managed 12 to 15 different people knocking on doors. So I had selling pretty cards. good experience prior selling cards. Yeah, the gas the uh, gas stations, uh, three free oil changes. I could probably do, still do the pitch because I've done it. I did it so many times <laughs> back in high school. Don't, don't, but, please uh, don't, please don't. So I had, I had the experience. Not going to, not going to do it. But yeah, so I had a, a significant experience knocking on doors and managing sales forces prior to that interview. So felt pretty lucky. It got in, got in there and, and uh, started my college works career. So, I mean, and, and not everybody that listens to the show knows what college works is. You run a business, you get to hire, you get to fire, you get to manage, you deal with the customers, you generate leads. Some of the ways you generate leads are awesome. Some of them are grind, grueling. You do the sales calls and you produce the job and it's all on you to get that job. You have to have worked three years or more. You have to have worked 30 hours a week or more. You have to have a tougher major. There's a few parameters that you have to get it. But you had done so much in high school. Most of our audience isn't from high school. But if mom and dad are saying, little league, little league, little league, tell them, no, mom and dad, I need a job. So you had had a few jobs. You had had this kind of your own business with these discounts. It's like a discount coupon. And he would go around and get people to buy the coupons. And he would get the shops to offer the discounts. And he was basically bringing in customers um, and the fee was these coupons. So you'd had these interesting kind of entrepreneurial experiences, which made you ready for to really test it in the college works environment as a freshman. We used to not hire freshmen until a few of them snuck in and they were the best managers we ever had. So we decided to get rid of that rule. So in college, you're studying business econ, you're studying poli sci, I'm studying history and poli sci. You do the college works gig. You were a manager, you had some skills, and you didn't love it, right? You left. Well, well, I, I, I love that. I, actually, no, I, I loved both all the experience. I was an intern for a year, did pretty well, was able to come back as a district manager the next year, 
love the experience of, of everything I thought I learned that first year. And I thought I, I was God's gift to business by the time I got done with my first year. I've learned so much. I know so much. And then I was a district manager. I realized I had just started to learn. I didn't know anything yet. And so I go into that district manager year of, of learning that first year of how to kind of manage myself and have the self-discipline for myself. And then the next year of DMing, being able to try to translate that and, and, and transfer those skills to other people, it was an eye-opening experience how much I had left to learn on, on how to work with and manage people. DM the entire year, but it was always my goal was to do a study abroad program uh, from the, the very first when I went into school. So I let the guys know who were running the, running the business at the time that I was going to be leaving my junior year. And so I did a study abroad program over in England. Um, which was a great experience. Didn't have to learn the language. Uh, there were lots of really good beer over there. So I uh, en enjoyed myself immensely. Got to play on the on the American football team for a college over there. So that was a good time. For what college? And then for Cambridge University. Hey, so, you got to plug uh, that shit, about... Jeff. You got to plug that shit. Yeah. Uh, by the way, Jeff, Jeff was kind of arrogant and asinine in his earlier years. And now he's overly humble. Uh, don't argue with me about how much <laughs> revenue your business does. And please, please name the college. So you got, so you're having your cake. You're, you're back to your why choose. I had this experience, this great experience, this internship that was teaching me all about business, really circling me around people that I admired and respected and I was learning from. And then I also knew I wanted to go do this, the, have this opportunity to do an expansion, uh, to do a study abroad program. And the people that run the business, Jay and Spencer, our, our partners now, were completely supportive. They said, "Yeah, go, 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 have that experience and and go and go do that." But I also was able to come back, and I did it for one semester. Came back, and I ran the business again in College Works that following summer. Um, realized at that point because I'd done internships other places, knew what I needed to do. Then I figured out, hey, this is where I want to be. All the things that I want to do. And so I don't I, I, trust me, I went out and I interviewed everywhere and I got a job offer pretty much everywhere I, I interviewed for a job. But everything fell in comparison to the opportunity I had, which was at College Works at the time, which was to be around people I admired and respected, to have a direct impact on people and to see it. It's so rare that you actually can have a meeting, can work with somebody for two weeks and see an immense change in their trajectory in the results, but also in their life because you're, you're working with people when they're younger. and that fulfillment I felt from doing that was hands down. I was I was all in. So I came back from that last year. That's when you and I started uh, running the business together. Uh, when when our other partners Jay and Spence went to go uh, start a mortgage company, and that was a that was a moment where it's like, hey, this is is this where I want to be? And sometimes you have to look around and 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 look at look look at your options, see what's out there in the world. But sometimes recognizing that where you're at is where you're meant to be. And taking the most, making the most of what the opportunity that you have in front of you, and make the most that you can with it. And that's the that's the heroin. And we didn't know we didn't know what we were addicted to at the time. But it's the sparkle in their eyes. It's the surrounding yourself with these highly motivated people. It's the value alignment, learn and grow, integrity, respect, do the right thing. And we had this place, and we stumbled across it. But I got a yellow card, you. Yellow card for humility. Yellow card for humility. You don't get to go study abroad or like Scott Olivet went off for a year and bank consultant kept paying him and, and get invited back unless you're awesome, unless you're striving to be the best version of yourself, the highest level of your capacity, dissatisfied, but still crushing it where other people would be satisfied where you were. So if you're listening right now and you're working in a company and you want to go study abroad, you get to do that if you're one of the best. Or you're working in a company, you want to take a sabbatical. I talked to Allie Becker yesterday on the phone. She works at Goldman Sachs, and she's got all these different opportunities at Goldman Sachs. And which way do you go? I'm like, wow, Allie, congratulations. You have like five awesome opportunities. Do I go to London with Goldman Sachs? Do I stay here with Goldman Sachs? Do I go there in this different department with Goldman Sachs? You don't get those opportunities if you're not choosing to produce the best version of yourself in every which way, striving for the highest level of your capacity and remaining dissatisfied while enjoying it. So I was there for that. And long story short, basically Jeff and I saved the business. No, I'm just kidding. Uh, <laughs> Jay, Jay, Jay and Spence had to leave for greener pasture. We loved what we were doing. 
we got involved and what happened? The greener pasture wasn't as fun and awesome. So they came back too. And then we ended up with this happy family and Jay took off and started another company. And then Jeff rolled out in another company with Spencer. And I still love College Works, but I want to spend a few minutes because we're going to run out of time on the other company. So we had this business in the East Coast as College Works business and you were in the East Coast and there was a few people on the East Coast and there were some government issues like blood testing. And we made a decision or you made a decision to, to change the business. And I'll tell you what I remember. I remember it being a $6 million revenue stream that shrunk down to about 1.6. That could be right. That could be wrong. doesn't matter. This is really my podcast. So we just go with that as fact, which is scary. I remember all the same people staying in the same places in the same buildings and just a sticker being pulled off the door and a new sticker being put on retaining everyone. I remember everyone having to learn a whole new industry and there being one major focus. Our brand's gonna be the best brand. We're gonna do the best by our customers. And I remember you guys taking off running um, and Brett and Max and Austin and you. Probably, I don't remember any frustration. I don't remember any fear. I don't remember any feelings of failure, but I remember it went from 6 million down to 1.6. And I think the second year it did 6, 12, 20, 35, 70, and now 150. What's the lesson for the group here on bravery, on vision? I mean, you're, you're a CEO, right? It's about the vision, the bravery, on team building. What's the lesson someone in their 20s can get out of this incredible, oh, on loyalty. We've always had this, like, this this loyalty and it's not loyalty from you to others it's this collective loyalty like austin and i still talk to jill's aunt on the phone because he took care of jill's aunt so what what are the lessons for someone that wants to start a business and do it the right way or want to take a brave move from what they're doing right now which is pretty successful and change it well, since a lot of the home genius guys will probably listen to this podcast, um, we'll just say that some of those numbers are a little bit different from what we usually talk about, but we're going to go with it. So <laughs> it's pretty, pretty, pretty darn close. Um, yeah, I know the last number might be a little, a little higher than target, but I think the other numbers were pretty close, weren't they? The growth was pretty, pretty close. I'll, I'll walk through them. It is, it's pretty good. So yeah, in 2019, you know, we had a, a, an opportunity. It was actually one of the guys who was a, a VP for College Works at the time, Max Alessi. He was going to actually leave the business um, because he that he needed to. He had some some medical things that were going on, so he just didn't work for the seasonality of our business. Didn't work, so I, I brought Max over to the, my house, the room right over here, and I said, Max, we as NSG partners, we want to be in the Max Alessi business. You know, so what was what, it that you are passionate about? And what he was passionate about was still home improvement. And then we said, okay, well, we've kind of done home improvement before. So if we're going to do home improvement, we, we're going to do it with, we're going to bring in Austin Killian, Brent Miller, who are other college risk VPs. And we're only going to do it if we, if we agree to a couple of things. First is we're going to go big. We're not going to, we've, we've done the thing before. We run a 30, 40, $50 million home improvement company before. If we're going to do this, we're going to go swing for the fences. We're going to become the next big national brand. We're going to be that billion dollar brand that everyone knows across the country. And that's our goal. We're going to become the fastest growing home improvement company in America. Now, you take some guys who are, you know, in their mid-20s, brought up to the College Works way. That's not a hard sell. Yeah. They're not going to sell. Very muscular. Don't forget, very muscular. Very muscular. Very handsome. And then there's Brent. Ah, oh, just kidding, Brent. Um, but this is <laughs> part of the equation was, at the end of the day, when you get a little bit later on in life, a little older uh, through, through your experience, it really should, should have, can happen at any time of your career. But what really starts to matter more is your legacy. And what are you proud of what you do? And I always share this, not just I'm on your podcast, Matt, but I always talk about when I, when I have this, this conversation with people about our, how we started, I talk about college works are the emotional soul of NSG. It's where we all started. It's where we all you know, learned how to be in business. We, it's where we learned how to work with people, how to care about people. And that part is, is, is near and true to us. What I wanted to make sure that we did in this brand is that for my kids, and I don't have 11, I only have five, but it probably could have been 11. But when my kids Google called or, uh, Home Genius Exteriors, 
I want to be 100% confident that I'm proud of what they see. And my partners in, in Brent and Max and Austin 100% bought in to that idea. And so our vision statement we, that we read earlier today, we had an all hands call. The all hands call a couple of years ago was 20 people on a Friday. Today, we had 175 people on our all hands call that we do every Friday. At the very beginning, we talk about our vision statement is to become the fastest growing and most respected home improvement company in America. Because you can do one without the other. You can be fastest growing and step all over people, treat people poorly, cut corners. It'll catch up to you eventually, but you can, you can do that. You can also just be most respected, stay really small, hyper-local, just do good work, but never grow. The challenge that we have is, can we do both at the same time? So 2019, you're right, we did $2.7 million in year one. Next year, 2020, COVID hits. We still position ourselves really well to do $6.2 million. And that's one of my favorite stories with Home Genius because the other operating idea we have is P is greater than M. People are more important than money, which is the kind of thing that companies always say, but it's actually what the actions are that the follow up, whether they actually believe that or not. So when COVID happened, we had we were 95% of our leads came from knocking on doors. So we had canvassers out everywhere. And obviously with COVID, no more canvassing. So we had to make a decision. I brought the guys in. I mean, you and I were fine. We had other incomes. We had you know, other, other things going on. For these three guys, the partners, the, founder, the co-founders for Home Genius, this was it. This was their only source of income. But I had to sit them down and say, hey, guys, we have two options. We can either let everybody go, furlough them, or we can, industry is willing to keep paying their salaries and keep them on board. Let's send them home and have them make phone calls on our database, see if that works. And it was less than a minute conversation for them to say, yeah, let's do the right by, everybody's scared. Let's do right by these folks. Let's keep everybody on board. And let's make this work. Now, in retrospect, it looks like a genius move because once COVID kind of settled down a little bit, people were at home, they were bored. We were in a good position to pick up and do really well. But when the decision was made, it was it was putting people first, which was great. So we did $6 million that, that, that year. In my infant, we do $12 million the next year. And I looked like an idiot by the end of the year because we did 21 instead. Then oh, we 35, skipped oh, there was my error. I said 1.6, it was 2.6. I said six, it was 6.2. There was no 12 year. He went six to 20. Six to 21, exactly, exactly. And then that next year we did 35. And then last year, our big goal was if we doubled the size of the business and got to $70 million. We had a big trip down to Mexico for everybody. We did 73. This year, our goal is to hit 150. And we're already almost 2.5X uh, this time, the same time last year. We just passed $55 million on our growth path this year. So. Our trend line right now says that we're going to do over $200 million. Uh, we'll probably do about 150 to, uh, to 160 this year. I got to pause you there for a second because there's a few things. For those of you pulled over on the side of the road listening, be in the Max, Austin, and Brent business. So how do you get yourself in the position to where someone you work with wants to be in your business? Brent, uh, value. One of the nicest people you ever meet, hard work, bravery, Austin, values, hard work, bravery, Max, muscles, good looking, great clothing, values, bravery, hard work. So you're not going to get into the Joe Schlepp business. You're not gonna. You're not gonna get to go to Cambridge and play football. You're not gonna get to travel the world and pick up a paycheck from Bain unless you are impacting and aligned in values. Um, so you can think, what am I doing for the company? What am I doing to be brave? How am I living the values? Because a lot of times the generation, the Gen Z generation, it's about them and nobody gives a shit. How can it be about the team? And how can you be more of a selfless, humble leader? Because if I'm gonna describe Austin Brent, Jeff Gunnis and Max, and I got to pick one word. Maybe it starts with selfless. I, I don't know. Maybe it starts with brave. Maybe it starts with humble. It would be hard for me to pick if I was only given one word. And I think back to these experiences I had with them that make me want to be in business with them. That one word is going to align with their values. And then you get to this vision. So you're sitting there and you have some pain points. You know, Jeff didn't say it. He didn't like the College Works brand at the time. I don't like the College Works brand on Reddit right now. I work there. We built our brand over years, built a wonderful brand. 
And then one kid in the University of Minnesota writes some shit on Reddit, and then a bunch of people take off on it. And we don't sit there and complain, although I'm complaining right now. We think, how do we make sure that that could never happen? How could that ever happen? Uh, we do, we're doing all these different things. How do we make sure it never happened? Well, it did happen. It did happen years ago. It's not happening right now. We, you know what? It almost happened again. We, that we had a team member that wasn't acting in alignment. So you have pain points where you are right now. Um, and Jeff's where he wanted to grow faster. He wanted a better brand customer service. How do you include your partners? How do you include your stakeholders into painting this collective vision that everyone at Home Genius was part of? It wasn't Jeff or Max or Brett or Austin saying, here's the vision. It was them asking, what should the vision be? And then they figured out that other people had the same pain point and other people had the same goals. And then they consistently message it. I knew what Jeff would say. I spend about an hour a month in home genius land, maybe. Um, but I know what's talked about there. I know what the, what the vision is and where they're going. And then finally, there's a lot of bravery. You, you got rid of $6 million and started over. That could have been zero. Then COVID hit. It could have been failure. Could have given up. It's bravery and problem solving in a collective way. So you want to, you're listening on the, in the car parked, pulled over on the side of the road at 1.5 speed, and you want to go into business. Well, who has your values? Who's brave that you know? What's the vision? What are you doing? It's not the product. Everybody thinks, oh, I've got this great product. I'm going to go start a business. That's not how you start a business. It's what you said it right, Jeff. You're in the people business. People want to give their blood, sweat, and tears as they move to the same value because you're treating them right. You're valuing them. You're respecting them. You're taking care of them. I don't know how many times I've heard every single one of my partners talk about, no, that person needs to be taken care of. And it started with Spencer and Ryan Jantz. It was always Spencer taking care of Ryan Jantz. And it's just everybody that I know in business and I spend time with and Jeff spends time with is worried about everybody lifting together. So sorry to cut you off. I just wanted to pop that in there. Continue with your story. No, that's a great, I, I appreciate that. I think that, you know, we always talk about that as well. Why fastest are growing? What's the reason behind fastest are growing? It's, it's not for the ego to be on these awards and be on these lists and that sort of thing. But for us, fastest growing just means opportunity. So we, we like a lot of hashtags in our business. So we have our, one of our hashtags is hashtag next up. Who's the next person that's up for a culture promotion in our company? Who's the next person that's going to become that sales mentor, sales manager, sales director? Who's that person um, that can come in, as happened recently, come in as a, a film marketing person knocking on doors for us? And some of our, 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 our door knockers can sometimes make six figures. It's a, it's a pretty good job. Went from door knocker to team lead to van manager to film marketing manager to going to a new state to expanding a new office for us in nine months. Started with no experience, nine months. Expanding to a new office, Sam Levy. Sam Levy is a badass. Oh, I got to meet <laughs> Sam Levy. So inside, so in, so our fastest growing is because we want to have opportunities for people to rise up with, with inside of our organization and to grow with us. But your point is is well taken. That ultimately, our other major hashtag that we have in our business is hashtag one of us. Hashtag one of us is we have a five five criteria we look at. To see when we do an interview, when we meet somebody, it's become a shorthand in our company. If you want to give someone the highest compliment in Home Genius, if I do an interview with somebody and the other the founders aren't there, and then, hey, how'd that interview go? If I, I can just say, yeah, she's one of us. Boom. End of discussion. We know exactly what we're talking about. And the five things are, just I'll do it really quickly, is number one thing is work ethic. We look at work ethic and grind the idea that people that come into our organization see effort as an investment that they don't say they, they look at effort and they, for example, you, you go to the, the gym, you can't work out at the gym one time, look in the mirror and go, Oh, guess it didn't work. We need people that are here for the long term. They understand that you have to pay a price for success. You have to pay a price over a long period of time to improve. And that work ethic and that grind is part of this. We are not here for prima donnas. We're not here for people who are think they're God's gift to business or they're super talented someplace else. They come in here and get special treatment. That is not us. You are here because you have a strong work ethic. You're willing to grind. You're willing to go. And, 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 and that ties to your values too. There is no arrogance. There is no seniority. 
everyone's in the trenches all the time in every national services group business, and we love it. That's part of it. Absolutely. The next is ambition. We always talk about, hey, you cannot be here because you're, you want to trade hours for a paycheck. We're here. We're the fastest growing, most respected home recruiting company in North America. We are moving fast. We're moving at light speed. We are a freight train. If that's not your ambition, that's okay. There are plenty of places you can work. You just can't work here. So you have to have a desire for personal greatness. You have a desire for excellence to push yourself. Otherwise, you just can't be here because you're not one of us. The third thing is discipline. And we bring discipline to mental, physical, intellectual. And this goes into how you do anything is how you do everything. Because you can intellectually be curious about things, but you don't spend the time to do it, the, the, your, the mental, you take care of yourself mentally in your emotional space. You can not take, if you don't take care of yourself physically, it's hard to be an overachiever to go out there and make things happen. So having the discipline in all aspects of your life is essential. Our fourth thing is extreme ownership. We do not tolerate excuses. You have to own your own success. We give unlimited amount of resources for people to have their success. We have access. People can call me directly and they do. Just ask for additional meetings. We're on Slack, which is so it's internal internet connection. So anybody can reach out to me at any time, whether they knock on doors, answer phones, sweep the floors. It doesn't matter. They can reach out to me and have a conversation. If they are not successful here, it's because they didn't put the effort out because we have the resources, the proven method of them to be successful in this business. And the last one, the most important is aggressive tenacity. Aggressive tenacity. So we always, I always use uh, Owen, my son Owen, as the example here. So Owen, do we have time for a quick story? Uh, well, we're out of time, but go ahead. Okay. <laughs> I'll tell it anyway, because it's a great story. So Owen is a lacrosse player. And no one's that kid that you don't have ever ask, have to ask me to, to, to practice. In the winter, he asked me to pull my truck around so that the truck lights will shine on the goal so we can practice it in the dark to shoot on goal. He's that kid. So, and he's pretty good. He's pretty good. He's small, though. He's just the smallest of all the kids. My other kids are like six, six foot three, six foot four. Owen's tiny, hasn't had a growth, growth spurt yet. So, in a game, if, if Owen scores a goal, then he's up, he's excited, he's asking for the ball, his stick's up in lacrosse, you know, you're, you're running on the field, you play offense and defense, he's running back on defense, on offense, he's asking for the ball, everything's great. As soon as he gets hit pretty good by a bigger player, hit to the ground or takes a, takes a big hit, he changes completely, or used to. His stick is on the ground, signaling, don't throw me the ball. He's on the outside, barely getting in after the ball. He's slowly, slowly jogging back on defense because it doesn't be part of this part of what's going on over there. He's a different player, same person, but different player because of the six inches between his ears. Something's changed. And there's the old, the old saying that it doesn't matter how many times you get knocked down, it's how many times you get back up. And we do not believe that at all at home jeans. What matters is every time you get knocked down is what are you like when you get back up? Do you get back up with a chip on your shoulder? Do you get back up a little pissed off? And we call it being pissed off for greatness. Are you pissed off for greatness to get back after and be more aggressive because you got knocked down? So I had this conversation with, with Owen. I said, Owen, listen, I can just be, you know me, I get good grades. I'll hit the high five. You score a goal. I don't give, I don't give a shit. Just get good grades. So I'm not, the, I'm not the sports dad. But if you want me to be, I can give you feedback. What do you, what do you want? He's like, yeah, yeah, tell me, tell me. I'm like, so I told him, I said, listen, there's, there's two Owens. There's the Owen that wants the ball. And the Owen that doesn't want the ball. And this is when it happens. So next time you get knocked down, I want you to think about that. I want you to kind of see if you can get back up and be more aggressive, have that aggressive tenacity. So next time he goes out there, he gets knocked down by this giant kid that plows him over. He gets back up. I see him take a minute. He shakes it off. He runs down the field and just starts hacking away at a guy and draws a foul. I think I may, I think I may have overdone it. <laughs> that wasn't the goal. It wasn't for you to hurt, hurt a kid. Yes, but it is. Yes, it is, Owen. Point, hurt, hurt them, Owen. <laughs> but since then, Owen has been the player that when he gets knocked down, he becomes a better player. And then we, and every single person at home, genius has heard that story about Owen. When Owen comes to our Q4 kickoff, he gets a little standing ovation because everybody knows the Owen story. Because for us, if you get, if you go 0 for 5, then you should be pissed off for greatness. You should be angry, have a chip on your shoulder. What can you do better to get better at this? If you have people quit on your team, 
What, what could I do better? I'm angry at the situation. I'm angry at myself for not being better. How do I get better? And that aggressive tenacity, so that work ethic, ambition, discipline, extreme ownership, aggressive tenacity, that is our hashtag one of us. If you're one of us, you can be here. If you're not one of us, you don't share our values, you can't. You can go work someplace else, and then we'll see you on the podium as you can clap for us. You missed one. You guys have a sixth. You have a sixth. And I know you have a sixth. It's enjoyment. And the company's fun, but that's not what I'm talking about. I'm not talking about having a fun time knocking on every door. I'm not talking about having a fun time firing people. I'm not talking about having a fun time when you're putting in 15 hour um, days all the time. I'm talking about enjoying the growth, enjoying the impact, enjoying the, the, the vision of your values coming together in something um, that's productive. And I did a podcast yesterday with my friend, Steve, and he said, Matt, you never work. And I said, I know. He said, because you love what you do. And I said, I know. I do what I do for fun and I do it for work, and I do it as a service for the community. It's all I ever do. It doesn't matter if I'm sitting here in this basement at this rental house doing it with someone I work with or one of my kids' friends, one of my friend's kids. I love the coaching and the drive and the excellence and the movement. So you guys have a sixth one, and it might there also might be love in there too. You might have a seventh one because there's a lot of love that goes around. Like and I, I always think about Austin and Aunt Rhody. Going out to Aunt Rhody's house at my request to repaint her whole house and charging her for one side of it. And then, no, he painted one side and then came out the next year and did a warranty job and repainted the whole house. And I don't even think she, she won't be listening to this. I don't think she knows that we tricked her. We warrantied her one side and painted the whole house. And that, and that was Austin. I mean, that's love. And that's, and then I, you know, the, the, what I, I see your videos. I see your meetings. I see your your Instagram photos that I'm one of the four people that like. Um, you guys are enjoying what you're doing. And you enjoy the grind. You enjoy the 12-hour days because you love the people you're with. You have fun when you can, but there's an impact and there's a growth. Well, I have one more question for you, Jeff. You don't get to respond to that one. When you think back early in life, this is my favorite question. What sacrifice did you make way back in time that you thought was like the biggest sacrifice and you can't believe you have to do this, but you look back and you're like, thank God I made that sacrifice. It changed my life. Mm. That's a good one. You know, from a, from a culture's perspective, it's not, it's not, it was not a massive sacrifice in retrospect, but at the time it felt like a big deal. I don't know why it felt like a big deal, but it did. But I, I did college works all four years of college. And so, you know, I was going every weekend on my spring break and I had this, this vision that all these people were having this great time on these weekends, on the spring break that I was doing, working on trying to improve myself and trying to work in a business. And at the time, like, man, I wonder what spring break would, would be like. And it turns out that the investment I made during that time Allowed me, it's allowed me to take some pretty badass spring breaks in my life. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> it really wasn't that big of a deal. And some of the people that had a really great spring breaks are not having such a good time right now. With we the we saw a doing. picture of one of them yesterday, I believe, in a mugshot. <laughs> we sure did. We sure did. So, yes, yeah, so I think I think at the time, you, you, there's always that FOMO. You're, you're feeling missing out. You're, everybody's having a better party and a better time. And I tell you, uh, you know, in... Uh, I, I felt it at the time, but I really, in retrospect, as you get a little bit older, really know it. Different between knowing something and feeling it. I felt at the time I was doing the right thing by investing in myself, taking myself seriously, but also surrounding myself with people that are enjoying what they're doing. You know, we in Home Genius, we have a, a, a charitable organization called Home Genius Cares. And one of them, so every quarter, every office chooses a local charity. And one of the charities we did in Philadelphia was there was an inner city. Uh, sports complex and the exterior of it is a big tall wall, really bad part of town, but it's covered with garbage for for you know like a mile of garbage. And we spent eight hours, all of us, cleaning this up together, and we had a blast. Yeah, and we had cuts and sprays. You guys everything. have enjoyment as your sixth thing, even picking up trash. Exactly, exactly. Even picking up trash is you, if you do it with the right people. 
if you find your own definition of what's one of us, what, what is that? Who is your tribe? Find the right people. It doesn't matter what you're doing. And then, and I had that in college works, the, the sacrifice wasn't really a sacrifice, even though it felt like that at the time. It was what it was needed for me to move myself forward to try to find my own level of excellence um, as I pursue my business career. Well, that's awesome. I just, and I, I can't believe how similar we are because mine is missing spring break too. I was supposed to go to Mallorca with my family and my brother went and I didn't go. And I promised myself I would go to Europe every year for the rest of my life, which I have. And in spirit of why choose, I just want to let you know, my kids wanted to go to Japan. Me and Jill are going to Italy. Why choose? I'm going all the way around the world and meeting my kids in Japan. So I'm going to be gone for a couple of weeks. Awesome. Run the show for me. Keep doing a great job. <laughs> Shout out to the Home Genius people. Shout out to Austin for the roadie and continuing the roadie mentality, I'll call it. Shout out to Max for always inspiring with his beauty as a person and his also external beauty. Shout out to Brent, who's you know one of the greatest people you'll ever meet, all due to their values and the home genius team. Jeff Gunnis, thank you for making more than an hour of time for me today and trashing my next meeting. Thank you for sharing all your insight. It was wonderful. Um, thank you for being on the Edge of Excellence.